What's good, Revive? My name is Freddie Romero, and I am part of the pastoral team here at Revive Church. And if this is your first time uh, joining us for an online service, welcome. Today we get to continue our series, Kingdom Come. And as we started to explore this central theme of the Bible, the theme of the Bible, uh, the kingdom of God, last week's uh, sermon with Pastor Noemi, we started to discover that this is a spiritual idea, a spiritual reality. And our goal today, as we try to dissect one of the parables and one of the mysteries of Jesus, um, there's this parable of the yeast in the flour. And the goal today is that we would understand the power of influence that is within our faith. And that influence, that impact that it could be uh, manifested in this world today. We need to understand not just what the kingdom is, but also what its purpose is. Many, many years ago when I was in, in college, I took a biology class. And at the end of the semester, in our final exam, part of the uh, test that we took, uh, part of the section that we were getting tested on was anatomy. And what anatomy is, is the study of the human body. And many of my uh, fellow students, they got, they aced that part. They knew all the intricate parts of the body, even the unseen parts, and how they all intertwined and worked together and functioned individually and supported the body, the shell, collectively. They under understood the mechanisms and the hows and the whats and where the things belong. They understood the body completely. They understood the shell. And what I came to understand with that anatomy test is that we understood the product of the body, but we didn't understand the purpose of the body. And just like those students in anatomy class learning so much about the human body but not knowing what the purpose of human life is, many people have become religious experts in our faith we become religious experts in the kingdom. We know what the kingdom is. We know what it ought to do. We know how it ought to show itself. We know how to call it by name. We, we, we know when it is, where it is. We know all these things, but we don't understand the why behind it. We understand the product of our faith, but most of the time we miss out on the purpose of our faith. And today, the goal is that we would understand that this isn't just something we do because we have nothing better to do. This isn't something we do because we are influenced by our, you know, our people in our circle to do. But this is something we do because we know the king of kings. We know the king of this kingdom. I want to reiterate that the kingdom of God is not a theme in the Bible. The kingdom of God is the theme of the Bible. And from the beginning of time, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus began his ministry, he begins, um, he has a moment with his disciples. And I think about this sometimes. Like, I think about, I think about if Jesus, who only had a ministry of three years, and I wanted to impact the world, and he only had three years, Jesus could have opened up a, a preaching school, teaching his disciples how to write very clever sermons, how to be engaging, how to be attractional. Or maybe he could have had leadership seminars, right, where he could have had conferences and, and taught his disciples how to fill up buildings and how to grow events and how to, how, how to recruit people and how to develop people. He had all these, all these ideas, but the one central theme that he constantly preached to the disciples, to the few, to those closest to him, was his kingdom. He could have preached many, many things. And when his disciples said, Jesus, Lord, Master, teach us how to pray. Jesus could have taught them so many different ways to pray. But he says, when you pray, pray like this. In the Lord's Prayer, after he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. After he sanctifies God's name, he honors God's name, he, he, he glorifies the name of God, he praises the name of God. The second thing Jesus said is, Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, from the beginning of time, this has always been God's plan. 
It has never been to be, you know, uh, Lord, let us, us, let us go to heaven now. Let us experience heaven now. But rather, let your kingdom come on earth. Let it be here like it is in heaven and from the beginning of time when, when God created man out of dust and he created woman out of the man, when he created Adam and Eve, his plan w- w- was, was already centralized, was already in focus from the beginning of time. And he told them in that garden, he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, he's saying grow internally, then multiply, spread out and rule. And when Adam fell, when when Eve fell, when men repeatedly fell throughout history, God did not change his plans. He knew that he wanted to establish his kingdom in our hearts. And through establishing his kingdom in our hearts, he would establish his kingdom all over this world. And so the first thing that Jesus does when he preaches, the first message you would think he hasn't, God, heaven hasn't spoken to earth for almost 400 years. And the first thing that comes out of Jesus' mouth when he preaches the gospel's recorders and says when Jesus Christ came, his first message was the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Now we got to remember that in this Jewish culture, they were, they were under Roman rule. They were oppressed. The, this people were, were, were clamoring for a savior and not just a spiritual savior, but a political savior, a revolutionary savior. Someone that would come and, and, and recruit militia and be able to start a revolution, maybe to overthrow the Roman government. They were quite dissatisfied with their way of living. And so when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, they said, Jesus, where is it? Jesus, how is it? Jesus, when is it? And Jesus kept reiterating so that they would understand over and over and over again, I am the door to that kingdom. Even the religious people who study scriptures, even they didn't understand. The Bible says that there was this this man who studied scripture. His name is Nicodemus. And you find him in the gospel of John in chapter 3, where he comes to Jesus at night to to ask him questions. Because he wants to be with Jesus in private. Because maybe he was embarrassed that even he didn't understand this concept of kingdom. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus, if you are not born again... You cannot see the kingdom. That is to say that to enter the kingdom of God, you must first die to the other domain, to the other realm. And so the question could be today, well, how is that possible? And humanly speaking, it cannot be because remember, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. But Jesus provided that death so that we could die to the power of darkness. And he also provided a resurrection so that we could be born again into the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus said, I am the door. You want the kingdom of heaven, you go through me. Last week, Pastor Noemi, she taught us that the kingdom has nothing to do. It has, the kingdom of heaven has nothing to do with political issues. The kingdom of God is something spiritual. When Jesus was, was wrongfully arrested and wrongfully tried, he was in front of this uh, Roman ruler called Pilate. And Pilate would ask him, they're saying you're a king. Where is your kingdom? Why aren't your people defending you if you're a king? And Jesus tells him, my kingdom is not of this world. We must understand that the kingdom of heaven transcends any human sphere and it can impact every aspect of human life. And how beautiful was it to learn last week that, that we have the privilege and the honor to fulfill our civic duties, our, our, our social responsibilities in the nation that is hosting us. But, church, we must not forfeit the responsibilities that God placed over the shoulders of the church. Whatever the church has been called to do, the church ought to do. We should not wait for man-made systems and man-made governments and all these kinds of isms to do what the church has been called to do. Sometimes we, we get frustrated because we're witnessing all the chaos in the, in the world. We're witnessing all the tragedy. And we know in the deepest parts of our 
souls that things aren't right and they could be so much better. But when we push for man-made systems as a solution to all the chaos in the world, all we're going to do is continue this cycle of frustration because man-made systems will always be flawed. They will always be flawed. And so when we think about the kingdom of God, when it is established, that is what our heart is yearning for. It's not yearning for a religion because Jesus didn't come to preach a religion. He came to preach his kingdom. And so before Jesus was ascended to heaven, when he resurrected, a lot of the people, a lot of the people that witnessed this, they said, Jesus, will, will, you, will you now restore the kingdom? We've seen you die. We saw you resurrect. We know that there is power and authority and dominion inside of you, Jesus. And Jesus said, they still don't understand. But in due time, he tells them in the book of Acts, you will receive power through the Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, what he was trying to do is replicate what God had told Adam and Eve. Be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, and rule it. You realize that God has not changed his plans, and he has not changed the plans that he's given us, and even more so, he has given us the opportunity to be a part of those divine plans. And so in this parable found in Matthew 13, verse 33, Jesus, it just, this parable is all but one verse. And Jesus quickly explains it. And, and I mean, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even explain it. But in that moment, the disciples would have known what Jesus was talking about. And he tells them this story. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Someone say, all through the dough. Gotta understand that the yeast, the yeast in, in, in Bible times, you, you know, a lot of times when we read scripture, we think that yeast, every time it's mentioned, it's, it's a bad thing. But in this context, it's actually a good thing. Let's understand a few things about yeast real quick. It's just basic, basic thing. The yeast is, is a microscopic fungi that, that feeds on the gluten in flour and causes it to, right, to rise. It inflates bread. You like the pan dulce and the donuts and cake. And that has yeast that allows the dough to rise. It is a staple in every bakery. And like I said, many people stumble upon this parable. They don't even want to touch this parable because they think it's a negative connotation, but it isn't. But the reason for this is because, because when you find yeast in other parts of Scripture, it's usually in context of something, something negative. And I'll give you a few examples in, in Luke 12. Scripture says, meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In Galatians 5.9, Paul writes, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And this is talking about legalism. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? This is talking about pride. But if you think about the scriptures we just read, the emphasis in every one of these scriptures when it mentions yeast is not the power of sin, but the power of the influence of such a small deed. And today I'd like to just present to you the idea that God is calling us to be a people, a church that is influential in the mix of the dough. In the parable of the yeast and the flour, we look at this. The, 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 the point of the yeast, when it's always found in Scripture, is to show its impressive ability to leaven, to permeate, and to influence whatever it touches Notice in this scripture that the amount of yeast is too small for the amount of flour. For it was 60 pounds of flour. Jesus, in another version, uses this illustration saying, The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she only put a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. 
The version we read said that it was 60 pounds of flour. What I'm trying to tell you is that the tremendous capacity that a little bit of yeast has to make something even greater rise, affected, and influences it to move we have, we who are of the kingdom have been given a commandment to multiply. And the first thing we multiply is the effect that the Holy Spirit has had in our hearts. And just as the yeast produces bubbles in the dough, it brings the air of the, we bring the air of the Holy Spirit every time we do the works of Christ. Every time we, we, we do good works, every time we help our neighbors, every time we minister in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, just like the yeast attracts oxygen and all these other air molecules to be a part of the dough, so too do we, do we bring the air, the pneuma, the Holy Spirit into our context. What this scripture is trying to tell us, what Jesus is trying to tell us is we are influencing others with the leaven, with the yeast of the kingdom of God. Anyone, anyone, anyone who loves to bake, anyone with yeast at home will normally have it in a bottle. And anybody with, with yeast at home will normally have it in a bottle stored in a cool, dry place. But that yeast in the bottle does nothing until you activate it. Yeast must be activated. As long as it is in a cool and dry place, yeast does nothing. It doesn't produce. It doesn't multiply. It has no signs of life. So how is yeast activated? You have to mix a quantity of yeast with warm water and a little sugar. And once you do that mix, you, you warm up the water just a little bit. And that mixture of water and, and temperature rising and sugar wakes up the yeast. And the sugar feeds the yeast because the yeast starts to eat. See, notice that the water doesn't have life, the sugar doesn't have life, and the temperature doesn't have life. The only thing that has life is this microscopic fungi called yeast. And what's in this mixture? It begins to activate and it shows itself by starting to bubble up, by starting to foam. But when you have it mixed in with the water and the sugar and you rise the temperature, you see it foaming. It doesn't serve its purpose only when it's activated. You must put that yeast into the flour, into the dough, and you must start to mix it in so that the flour and the dough could rise and inflate so that you can bake this bread. And sadly, we have realized that many believers are like that yeast in a bottle. Sometimes these believers are, we're, we're cold and we're listless and we're spiritually asleep. We have so much potential to affect our surroundings, to affect our community, to do something amazing in this world. But we do not multiply, we do not produce, and we have no influence over the worlds around us because we are bottled up. We have to get activated. Someone say, we have to get activated. Go ahead and put that in the comment section. Let's get activated. And how do we get activated? Just like yeast, we, we have to get activated with the water, with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God running in our souls. We have to get activated with the warm temperature of an updated relationship with God in adoration and in praise. And, and also the warm temperature of fellowship, of not doing life alone. The warm temperature of being in community, of being in a life group, of being with other believers that are praying and worshiping in this atmosphere. And we have to be, uh, we, have to, we have to put some sugar in it, right? And the sugar in scripture, it always represents the love of God. And the love of God is a spirit that cancels out all bitter things. But remember, being activated still isn't enough. Jesus didn't die on the cross and the kingdom wasn't given to us so that we would just be activated. We would, we would love our high fives and, and we would love to be with one another. We love our Sunday services. How many people, imagine if the yeast said, oh, how I love seeing, you know, the sugar and the water only on Sundays. The yeast once it's been activated, does not fill its purpose until it is mixed in the dough. And so once we have been activated, once we have come and decided to follow Jesus, to become disciples of Jesus, once we, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have to get in the mix. And the dough here represents the community where we live. The dough represents the influence to extend the kingdom of God to our unsaved neighbors. A young man came to a pastor I know and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. And the pastor said, Son, 
Why do you need prayer? He's like, for my job situation. And the pastor said, son, but you have a good job. You have great pay. Yes, pastor, but I'm the only believer at my workplace. And so the pastor prayed for him and he said, Lord, may his employer never, ever, ever fire him. Thank you for giving him this job. And the young man said, pastor, that's the opposite of what I want. I want to leave because remember, I'm the only Christian there. And the pastor says, son, why do you think God put you there? Sometimes we want to, want to, we want to run away from the darkness, darkness like the power of darkness has more power than the power of light and the power of kingdom, the power of Jesus. And God has called us to be salt and light in this world. Don't hide your flavor. Don't hide your light. Shine with his grace. Shine with his love. Shine with his peace. Shine with his authority. Shine with the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you. Shine with his righteousness. Shine with his beauty, his grace, his peace. Don't hide your light. Get activated. Get into the mix. Don't shy away from your mission and from your calling. And when you see darkness around you, the Bible says where darkness uh, is, it, it permeates, grace abounds even more. You see, light will always pierce the darkness. It is always more powerful than the darkness Jesus had a reputation for being a rabbi, for being someone who preached kingdom, but the religious people didn't like him because he would eat with tax collectors and prostitutes and notorious criminals and, and well-known sinners. And they would question his friendships with other people that they wouldn't associate with. And they would say, how can you eat with them? You know how dirty they are? You know, you know what they've done before? You know what kind of history he or she has? But Jesus would be with them because they wouldn't influence him. He would influence the sinner. He would influence a sinner to repentance, to come to understand that everything they were searching for in this world is nullified, is insignificant when compared to the, to the majestic opportunity that it is to have Jesus in their lives and so what Jesus did is, is he carried the nature of the kingdom within him. And wherever he was, he would, he would permeate that culture. Oftentimes we're waiting, we're looking to see what, what the world is doing, what the culture is doing, so, so that we could put a little bit of that and sprinkle a little bit of that into the church. When it should be the other way around, the world should be taking its cues from the kingdom so they could sprinkle a little bit of what we have into the mix that they have. This is the influence that Jesus is speaking of when he talks about this parable, the yeast in the flour. I want you to understand, like I was come to realize this, this, this amazing principle, the value of small things. Someone say that with me, the value of small things. This is, this is what it's showing us. The first piece of spiritual yeast was put in Bethlehem in Israel. And Bethlehem means, means uh, the house of bread, essentially a bakery. And that little piece of yeast grew, but for 30 years it was unknown. And it walked the dirty streets of Galilee. It walked the dirty streets of Judea. It walked the dirty streets of, of Samaria. And for that piece of yeast to serve its purpose, it had to be mixed in the dough. It had to affect the culture and the community around them. And Jesus was tried and convicted and executed. But on the third day, he rose victorious. And before ascending to heaven, he tells his own, wait for the promise. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for that awesome ingredient that's about to come and baptize you in fire. And so before he ascends to heaven, he's with 120 people. Only 120 people are expecting this promise. But later, they are activated and those 120 people later become 3,120. And then the following week, those 3,000 became 8,120. And the Bible says that the Lord continued to add daily the disciples that were to be saved. In other words, after 10,000, they stopped counting because the yeast, the spirit inside of them was activated. The church was activated and they started to attract. They started to share the gospel. They started to preach hope. They started to ignite hearts and people started to live in freedom. 
And the church grew, and Scripture says, you know what, I'm going to stop counting. The Lord continued to add daily to those that were being saved. Please never underestimate the power of the kingdom. Never underestimate the value of small things. Sometimes we want to we wanna get out of debt by, by winning the lotto. That's, that's a wishful thinking. You know how, how we can conquer massive death not using our credit cards. Sometimes, sometimes we want to lose weight by, by getting a magic pill. You know, you know, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's about just walking a few miles every single day. It's doing the little things that have the most major impacts in our lives. And sometimes we want God to do a miracle in our government, a miracle in our nation. When God is saying, I want to do a miracle in your heart. I've already saved you. Now let me influence you. Let me baptize you with my Holy Spirit so that then you can go be into, get into the mix and influence your surrounding. See, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. The world would have us believe otherwise, but you got to understand when you look at the legacy of the church from its, from its inception, the church has always influenced culture. See, when you talk about, when you talk about social progress and, and the legal system and when you talk about education and the greatest pieces of art, when you talk about music and the dignity of women, when you talk about human and social rights, all these things aren't a world issue. All these things are a kingdom issue. All these things were born out of the creativity to be able to influence this world. Everything reflects our faith. What other institution, what other institution has been able to, to, to rescue people from the pits of hell, like, like literal hell, and, and been able to rescue people from, 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 you know, like oppression and persecution and been able to put their lives on the line for other people? See, Jesus didn't say the world will know you. The world will, the, the, Jesus did not say the world will know you are mine by your bumper stickers. Jesus didn't say the world will know you by the signs on your front yard. Jesus didn't say the world will know you by your social media posts. Jesus said the world will know you are mine by how you love each other. The question becomes, do we love our neighbor enough to put our lives on the lines for theirs? To say, I've discovered the light. I've discovered the yeast that has activated my life. I want to be a part of that mix. Lord, give me an opportunity to witness. Give me an opportunity to share the gospel. Give me an opportunity to lead someone to your kingdom. Let me introduce someone to you, Jesus. This is one of the most hopeful parables. You, you, and inside of you, the Holy Spirit, you have the yeast and the power to permeate and to influence your environment. In ancient times, when a daughter of a Jewish mother would marry, the mother would give her Jewish daughter some gifts. And one of the gifts that the mother would give the daughter was the last piece of yeast used in the last um, baking event of the household. And she would give the, the newlywed daughter um, the last yeast in a bottle so that when the daughter first baked in her new home, she would use the yeast from her mother's home. What did this symbolize? It symbolized that all the best, all the good, all the blessing that that previous family had would be now carried over to the next family. That's what God wants for your life. That's what God wants for our lives. He wants us to continue this eternal purpose that you and I get to be a part of. Remember, the kingdom of God influences first from within first from within. And it's not so that we come collectively together on one day a week. See, Jesus, I, I think this has always been the plan of God. And, and, and the Lord said, let me, get, let me get my children out of the bottle. Let me get them out of the box. Let me get them out of their buildings right now so that the whole world could hear the gospel of this kingdom. And you would say, really? Really, Freddie? That's what you're going to say in this moment? Well, it's in scripture. Matthew 24, verse 14 quotes Jesus saying this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. 
And like never before, like never before, Revive and other churches, we've been, we've been challenged to now go online. And when we look at the, at the feedbacks and the analytics, we have people watching us in, in South America and in Mexico and in Salvador and in Germany and in different states and in places we never thought of putting a campus in the Philippines. We have people watching. And we're not the only church that is being watched online in different remote parts of the world. This has always been God's plan. And his plan will continue to move and permeate through the dough. The question is, will you and I be a part of this? And so I want you to get activated. If you are not part of a life group and have not been a part of one for a few months, maybe a year, now is the time to get activated. On the screen, you can see the information so that you can plug yourself in here at Revive. We say, don't do life alone. It's not just a motto. It's not just a slogan. It is the reality. It is the, the anthem of our church because we know that collectively we can be activated and be able to affect much dough. And if this is the first time you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'd like to introduce you. I'd like to introduce you to a man who will never fail you. I'd like to introduce you to a God that can hear you, a God that has power, and a God that has extended his love for you. I'd like to extend that invitation to be a part of the kingdom. And all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. That's what scripture says. And so I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Remember, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's not these words. It's the faith in the one we're praying to. So right now where you are, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I recognize that because of your love and your grace, you died for me on that cross and I recognize that you resurrected to give me the opportunity to be a part of your kingdom say be Lord of my life thank you for saving me thank you for forgiving me of my sins activate me Lord and show me the purpose that you have for my life in Jesus name we pray Amen and amen. If you just prayed that prayer, please connect with us. You see the information on the screen. Please send us a text message. Send us an email. We'd love to know your story and pray alongside of you. Remember, church, our call is not to be bottled up. Our call is not to be put into a corner. Our call is to be activated, to permeate, to influence the world with whatever little we have. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.